cool. Well, let's jump in. So, Amanda, let's start uh, by you telling the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so, my name is Amanda Davenport. I am the director of talent acquisition at Submittable. Um, I've been in the talent acquisition space since, I guess, technically 2018. Um, I kind of fell into it by accident. Uh, I think there are a lot of us that way that <laughs> got into TA that way. Um, prior to that, I had been working in sales, like account management, customer success management, kind of started cutting my teeth in leadership, um, managing like a global contact center for um, an IT managed services provider. Um, I did a little bit of like IT service delivery and um, really, I think, one of the things that um, helped me be successful throughout my career was um, I just really love process improvement and like to be as efficient as possible. And truly, that's how I ended up being in a uh, talent acquisition. We were um, hiring at volume for my team, a ton of uh, customer service reps, and um, you know, we didn't have like a very robust HR team. And the thing with really early career candidates as they get the good ones get snatched up really quickly um in the state of washington i mean we have like such a hard time being competitive and keeping like our cost model um in a place that was attractive to to candidates but that like also didn't you know ruin our um margins um and we were competing with like a gas station down the street that was paying like 17 50 an hour like um so I, I lovingly joke that I effectively staged a coup and said, mm, can I just try to do this? <laughs> uh, and um, it was actually not a great coup because the HR with the team was like, great, thank you. Um, and so we kind of just, you know, played around with it and tried some things. And I was really lucky that I worked for a company that was like, sure, go figure this out. Um, and then they were like, hey, maybe you should do it for the rest of the company. And that's how I ended up in TA. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That's a good story. <laughs> the coup de talent acquisition. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It was, it was really <laughs> um, too. And like, I'm going to do this <laughs> or else. And they were like, no, please <laughs> take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I guess it's not necessarily a coup if it's, it's voluntary no. by the leaders of the organization <laughs> because they realized that it was needed. No. <laughs> um, so before we jump in, I'd love to learn more about some yeah. but I'm curious in that experience, you know, um, when you jumped in and, and saw a need to make some major changes to the process and the way that you guys were hiring, so you're at a company, mm -hmm. seemingly it, it sounds like there was an HR team that was kind of also in charge of hiring. What were some of the, I guess, process issues that you were seeing and, and what did you do to resolve those? I mean, first and foremost, we didn't have one. Um, so there was that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, really, we revamped the entire thing from how we write job descriptions to how the interview, the interview process, interview expectations. Um, we tried all sorts of like crazy things with like group interviews and one on one interviews and, you know, what's too much and what's too little and um, all of that. We uh, revamped our careers page, the application process, what we needed to see in an application. Um, we tried to add in some automation so that we didn't get completely inundated with um, applicants that just weren't um, gonna be, you know, uh, qualified for whatever reason, you know, like if we were hiring in Seattle and we had a bunch of people applying from Texas, like how do we figure out how to get all of those out mm. so that a human doesn't have to spend time, you know, looking at all of those. Um, yep. And then as we kind of continue to, ref like, words are hard, so this is what you get for scheduling this on a Friday morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we continue to reiterate the process, um, we started to de like just develop things like core values and key competencies and attributes, and um, we started to be able to articulate, you know, what were the things that the team was doing today that were really successful. Um, if we looked at our top twenty percent of um, our like performers, like what skills would we want to, um, 
you know, clone. Um, and then from like an organizational design perspective, like, are there skills that the company would benefit from holistically that we don't have on the team? And is there a way to kind of work those in um, as well? So we're on the like extra lookout for somebody who has like this specific skill or this specific experience so that we can start to bring that into the team and have that as part of like our skill portfolio, if you will. Um, that's really how Very we started. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like there was quite a bit of work to do and you guys really started from the ground so and built it all the way up. And yeah. the, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, it sounds like a great challenge mm -hmm. um, and a great entry into talent acquisition for you. I'm sure you learned a ton by going through all yeah. of that. How do you like for a company that might be experiencing something similar where it's like, okay, we have to completely build up a foundation. Like, how did you know where to start? Um, well, I had the unique perspective of, perspective of being the hiring manager. So I knew what my expectations were that were not being met. And I knew how um, the work being done up front was impacting my team's ability to execute. And so I kind of just focused on reverse engineering it from there. And as we got closer to the top of the funnel, how do we start to prioritize things like the candidate experience and um, employer branding and all of that kind of stuff to shift the type of uh, candidate that we're attracting. So I think, yep. um, you know, I would assume that a lot of people in that situation don't have the luxury of being the hiring manager. Um, and that's the really tough part, right? So um, that's where business partnerships come in and are really, really important. As a side note, I will like soapbox for a really long time about the importance of like business acumen and understanding um, like a business operation and how all of the different um, the functions of a company interplay together to, um, you know, work and be successful. Um, but that starts with building strong uh, relationships with with leadership um, and like the hiring manager. So wherever you're hiring the most, wherever you struggle with hiring the most, you really got to dig in and get in there and figure out what it is and why. And there's likely a lot of coaching that needs to happen on the hiring managers and um, potentially even some thought shifting on why you haven't had success previously. So um, something that I think is really common, um, someone leaves, you get a new territory for a sales rep, you are going to launch a new product, like whatever the use case may be, hiring manager panics because I need butt in seat. <laughs> I need butt in seat now. Talent, go find me the butt, <laughs> right? Um, and the, the challenge or where I think talent acquisition has, um, so much potential to be really business impactful is saying, okay, yeah, I'm going to go find you that person, but we need to take the time up front to like really think about what does success look like? And if you can't articulate that for me yet, like we need to have some conversations where we're peeling back those layers and asking a lot of questions and getting curious. And the cool thing about that is that's where you as a TA professional get that business acumen, get that operational awareness, get that um, just that like skill awareness of, you know, what is this hiring manager going through and what are they truly trying to accomplish and what is their business initiative? And you don't have to understand what any or all of that is, but like your job is to challenge them to think about it and to talk it out. And then out of that comes your ideal candidate profile. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's how you, you transition the relationship between TA and a hiring manager from being transactional to being strategic mm -hmm. and where you're working together. And I think to your point, you know, the business acumen is so critical 
um, because it helps you get, it helps you ultimately get the buy-in from the hiring manager um, because it helps you tie the why you're doing the things you're doing up front in the beginning of the hiring process to the outcomes and the things that the hiring manager is ultimately going to care about down the line. And when you have the ability to tie those things and marry those things together, that's when you get the hiring managers really buying into the process and really wanting to work with you because they can understand why they're doing something versus, hey, fill out this intake form so I can learn more about the job you're hiring for. And the hiring manager's yeah. like, okay, this is just like you know, work for the sake of work for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you can really take them through why and you can use your business acumen to tie it into why this matters for the hiring manager and ultimately for their team, yeah. um, you know, that's really where, where you get that strong partnership. I think, you know, you also made a really interesting point about when thinking about process improvement um, and you were talking about how you were noticing all these issues from a hiring manager perspective and that's what helped influence where to start. Mm -hmm. I think there's actually a lot of insight there for teams that maybe are in a position where it's like, all right, our process is broken. We got to examine everything. Honestly, your hiring managers and your candidates will give you the Literally. answers. You just need to go talk to them and uncover what all of the issues are. So whether it's, um, you know, something in your actual hiring process, hiring managers will tell you where the bottlenecks are or when they're speaking with people that aren't the right fit or whatever the issues are. And similarly, as you think about your candidate experience, if you find a way to gather that feedback from your candidates, like they will tell you what you need to do. And that at least like establishes a baseline of probably way more stuff to do than you even have time totally. to do. Um, so I think that was a, that was a great point that you brought up is like ultimately when in doubt, just to speak to your hiring managers, to speak to your candidates and, and they'll kind of point you in the right direction. Yeah. I just, I, um, I think just one of the things that I found, especially over, uh, a, my time at Submittable is just that town acquisition when done well is much more a strategic function than it is a tactical one. Um, and a lot of folks, in TA and outside of it are, uh, I don't want to be offensive, but like struggling to get there, <laughs> uh, in mm -hmm. terms of like shifting their, their thoughts on how to position their, their talent folks that way. Um, yep. you know, like TA is not just a means to an end and you're, if you do it yep. right, um, you know, that's your, your talent management, you know, especially if you consider that, <clears throat> onboarding if you do that right should last a minimum of 90 days um sometimes up to six months sometimes a year depending on the complexity of the organization and the role and the function um yep there's a lot of room for error in there um if you make it about higher um there's also a lot of room to see a ton of impact in a short period of time um, if you are really precise about what it is that you are looking for and you can articulate it clearly. Yep, 100%. I think, you know, there's a lot of teams that when they go to hire the way they build their process is just simply to do the things they think they should be doing in order to hire somebody. But it's not really tied to any type of desired outcome or what are we trying to improve this time versus that time? Or how can we make the experience better? Um, you know, it's just like, okay, here are our steps. Here's the job. Here's who's going to do what as part of the process. Go. And like the process will run because there's a process. But at the end of the day, like the outcome you're getting or the speed at which you get that outcome or the sentiment that your candidates have about your company, um, you know, are really, uh, are really dependent on that process and all of the things that you do to, to level it up and make it better and make it competitive. Totally. Um, because at the end of the day, other employers are doing those types of things. And if you're not, and you're just like running the status quo process that like, Hey, I'm doing this because this is what I think we should, that this, these are just the steps I think we need to take in order to yeah. hire. Um, you know, you're, you're stagnant and, and other companies are moving past you. And I think there's so many teams now that are taking a more strategic approach and are taking a leap forward. And so I think if organizations don't look at talent acquisition as a strategic function, at the end of the day, they're going to be left behind, um, with these other employers that are, um, and they're hiring the people that that organization wants to be bringing on board. 
Um, and that's really what's going to have the lasting impact, you know, 12, 18 months down the road. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. I know, you know, we got you, we got your bio and then we diverted because, you know, I thought we, we got into some good stuff there. Um, and that was, that was awesome. Um, but I'd love to circle back. You're at Submittable yeah. now. Can you tell me a little bit about the company? Totally. Um, just for framing, uh, what do you want to know? Like how big we are, what we do? Yeah. Of- yeah. How, what's, what is, I guess, first of all, you know, what does the company yeah. do? Um, you know, what's, what's the product, the service, how many people are on the team? What does your team look like? Sure. You know, just basic information. Yeah. Like that. So, uh, submittable, we, um, kind of branded as like a social impact company. Um, we say that our um, our mission is to accelerate that of our customers or to accelerate mission-driven work. Um, our products are um, in the like corporate social responsibility and grants management space. So we really serve three ver- verticals. Um, the first is our uh, state government and city government entities um, where we primarily are offering uh, submissions SaaS software to um, really help all of their grant programs work more seamlessly. Um, And that looks like everything from um, much more simple and accessible design to people applying for the grants to all of the stuff on the back end, um, whether that's automatic review, um, you know, the system being able to say like, yes, you qualify, no, you don't, um, including uh, fraud detection, automatic funds distribution, and the ability to um, distribute funds from a financial institution and different forms of payment, um, tracking the payment success, um, as well as providing data and metrics to uh, the, the program managers. Um, in terms of, you know, how many applicants have they received of those, how many of them were qualified, you know, what's our success rate with payments? Do we have a lot of people that aren't getting their money because something is failing? Um, so that's kind of the grants management piece. Now you see that also, um, a lot in the corporations and foundation space as well as nonprofit. Um, and then the other side and kind of like our, um, newer product where we're seeing a ton of R&D effort um, this year is with employee engagement. And that looks like um, volunteerism. Um, we just launched an ERG feature, which I'm super excited about. I lead our um, mm-hmm. ERGs at Submittable, and so we're actually going to try it out um, internally and use it. So that's exciting. Um, corporate giving and matching. Um I already said volunteering. Um, that's really it. Um, yeah. Kind of like what cool. the company does. Uh, we're about 220 employees, uh, give or take, um, with roughly, these are very rough numbers, so don't quote me on them, but roughly half, <laughs> um, less than half maybe. Let's go 40-40-20. So 40% in <laughs> Missoula, which is where we're headquartered, 40% in the greater Seattle area out of our Bellevue office, and the remaining 20% um, is distributed across the United States. And we've got everyone, we've got, uh, I think we're in 29 states now. Uh, so we've got employees all the way in Hawaii, all the way to New York, and everywhere in between. Very cool. And what does the talent team look like? The talent team, you're looking at it, um, mostly. Right. Um, no. Um, uh, <laughs> so our people operations team is a team of five. So we have our chief people officer. Um, we have our HR manager. We have uh, our HR ben- um, journalist. She focuses on, like, um, benefits administration. And then we have a people ops coordinator, and she's, like, half-time HR pop projects and then the other half-time helping with um, talent coordination. And then um, outside of that, I have these two super stellar rock star um, contractors that are helping with the actual talent acquisition motion from like a, you know, like screening and hiring and sourcing perspective. Yep. Um, and then in times like now, when we're not 
super busy. Um, I am lucky enough to be able to lean on um, those contractors for support with um, internal process improvement and um, other types of project work that like where my list like seems to be like consistently growing and then we'll be like oh hey go hire these 30 positions and it's like oh okay let me put that on the back burner um and so like we're getting to make some like really cool progress um on that stuff so we're excited about that yeah that's a great point and i you know there are a lot of companies that are in a similar situation right now where hiring velocity isn't what it was perhaps in 2023 or 2022 or whatever it is um and so i'm curious you mentioned the big emphasis on process improvement where, you know, during these times, where are you focusing your efforts to make sure that you're making those leaps forward so when hiring velocity does pick up again, uh, you guys are in a much better spot than you were previously? Yes. So, um, tangentially to that, um, you know, one of the, the things that I, I think is really important is, like, how do you consistently gather feedback store it and then prioritize what you're going to work on when you have time. Um, we use Asana and it's a life changing tool. Um, so if you, I'm not a paid sponsor of, um, Asana, but <laughs> any <laughs> Trello, like any, any of that kind of stuff is so super helpful. And the other thing is though, we've adopted like the sprint model. So if you're familiar with, um, like the, software life cycle um you know we work in six week sprints um to be able to like carve like bite-sized pieces along the way um and then as stuff comes up uh we have this like bucket in the sauna where it's like ooh, that sucked or that was painful or that was really great we want to see more of that and it like goes in this bucket and then when we do our quarterly planning, we're looking at that and saying like, okay, what feels like the biggest, you know, hurdle or challenge or where do we want to spend like most of our time? You know, what does our hiring projection look like? How do we prioritize how much of the stuff we get to work on versus, you know, other things? Um, and then the other thing that I think is really cool is like we have kind of these like four overarching OKRs that were decided on from our C-suite. And so everything that we need to do when we're going through the prioritization exercise is does it tie back to one of these four things? And if it doesn't, then probably needs to be lower, you know, some of the other things. Um, so to give you an idea on what that looks like um, for us today, um, so in, in 2023, we started uh, revamping our compensation philosophy. Um, we're implementing job levels. Um, we're implementing um, like a, we're changing the way that we build our pay bands to have everyone based off of tier one geography. So regardless of where you are, um, kind of two prong attack there, one, that's how we stay market competitive, regardless of where we're hiring, because we're hiring um, and budgeting to pay people in like the most expensive part of the country. So if you're not familiar with tier one geography, that's going to be Seattle, San Francisco, New York. Um, there's another one in there, but those are big ones, right? Where it's like astronomically expensive to live, right? So everybody at Submittable yeah. is being paid off of those bands. Um so that's part of our philosophy and how we, um, an, an attraction standpoint. Um, the other one is also a lot easier to um, administer. And so there's a lower admin lift um, on our people up team and on payroll because we don't have to have all of these different bands. Um, so that's part of it. Um, we were also uh, leveling roles into like, six levels um, and uh, building in our career family so that we can match that with career ladders and have uh, more uh, intentional and um, it was successful conversations with employees about what does growth look like, both from developing skills and earning potential. Um, and how do you decide if 
you want to be a high earning individual contributor or do you feel like people leadership is your thing um, or you're in sales and you hate it and you really want to code or um, what I wish we saw more of like engineers that are like actually probably going to be really good salespeople like making that shift like how do we support um, that so that's been one of the things that's been a huge uh, focus on us um, for us for the first quarter. Um, the other one is really building out a robust DEIB roadmap. Um, uh, every, and like, listen, we have work to do. Um, and you can always do better, right? So we're, um, you know, looking at how do we benchmark and um, doing some research on like, where should we be and where are we now and how do we get there and what does that look like and what kind of initiatives does that have um and then uh the other big thing that we're working on is uh standardizing the interview process for uh the entire company and so that um has a few prongs if you will to it um one driving uh, standardization and just really trying to bring all of leadership together to say like, hey, when we are interviewing, here are the things that we have seen be successful and so here are the things that we care about. Um, one, uh, behavioral based interview questions. Uh, so we believe that uh, past behavior um, is a good predictor of future output. Um, and so we're asking questions based on that. Um, the other one is culture. And, you know, there's a lot of um, dialogue right now around culture fit versus culture ad. Um, I actually don't hate culture fit um, if you are articulating what that means to you. Um, so for us, it's like, does our culture fit or match what you're looking for, as opposed to do you fit um, us? And so it's like yeah. from a candidate perspective, do we fit? And from an employer perspective, how do you add? Um, and so uh, one of our big groups, our engineering group has um, a set of operating principles that are core to like their function and their engineering culture. Um, and so one of the things that I'm excited about for this year is like building out those operating principles for other big divisions. Um, but for now, we'll be focusing on like our main core values and developing interview questions that are open-ended and behavioral based um, around those. Um, I think you know, we're also looking at how do we bring in some more skill-based um, assessments and um, you know maybe try to automate or remove the lift on um, measuring key skills and removing um, like the bias from um, or the subjectivity subjectivity and bias from um, you know, evaluating those skills. Yep. Um, you had a lot on our plate. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you definitely have a lot on yeah. your plate. I'm curious, is there anything you're doing right now, like in your, you know, maybe you're hiring for a couple of roles, right? So it's intermittent, but are you doing anything proactively right now in your ATS or in your workflows or in the templates? Like, you know, that type of maintenance work. So again, when you when you start, you know, hiring at a higher velocity, you've made some improvements yeah. there. Uh, great question. Our uh, CEO has kind of given me this pep talk um, two years in a row now, which is basically uh, buckle up January gets a little chaotic. Um, and he's not wrong. Um, but typically what that means is once we figure out, you know, what our marching orders are in our direction, um, Q1 oftentimes provides a lot of opportunity for us to like really dig in and set ourselves up for success for the year. Um, and so that looks like things um, we do our 
a yearly audit of job descriptions and job posts, um, checking them for inclusive language, accuracy, pay bands, um, do they still match, that kind of thing. Um, yep. uh, email templates, um, looking at, we use Greenhouse as our ATS and my um, like one little bit of um, challenge is with their candidate experience surveys. You don't really, you have no um, ability to edit any of that. So um, we do spend quite a bit of time looking in into the information that we get and trying to pull um, pieces of information out of that that can either go into our interview prep guides that we send candidates, um, feedback that can go to hiring managers about the hiring process or ways to like make tweaks in the information that we provide interview loops um, on how to you know, interview readiness and all of that kind of stuff. Um, yep. We also will use this time to take a look at data over like the last year and look at things like cost per hire versus cost per comparative hire. Um, how many interviews on average does it take before we make an offer? Um, we'll dig into our um, offer acceptance rate and try to pull some things there to see, you know, where did we miss the mark on those um, offers that didn't get accepted and kind of like put all of that together and then start to make um, adjustments so that by the end of Q1, um, you know, we've taken all of our learning from 2023, applied that into our system so that we're ready to go um, once Q2 hits. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I think the fact that you just brought up looking into your, A, the responses from the candidate experience surveys that you're sending out, and then B, the data that you're housing in your ATS around all of the key metrics that mm -hmm. you want to improve. It's really hard. I mean, obviously you could do it, but it's really hard when there's a lot of hiring happening yeah. to say like, let's look at our hiring analytics and see some metrics that we aim to move and make process changes to move those metrics and then see how that all plays mm -hmm. out. It's hard okay. to do when you've just got, you know, a million roles coming yeah. on. Like you can make changes, sure. Um, but the reality is you've just got so much going on. It's, it's hard to find the bandwidth to do so. Mm -hmm. And so that's where in a time like this, you actually have the opportunity to dig in. And this is where some of the biggest strategic changes can actually take yeah. place. And then you're able to measure those things when, you know, you're able to put volume through the pipes. Yeah. You know, volume tends to expose any types of inefficiencies or efficiencies. And it then allows you to easily see, like, is what we're doing working or not working? Yeah. Um, so, so that's awesome that you guys are are digging in there. That was going to be one of my questions is, you know, you, I think, you know, you're bringing a lot by way of process improvement to talent acquisition. And so when you look to make changes, um, how are you measuring the impact of those things? Like, how do you, it sounds like you guys run an OKR model or some adapted version of OKRs. Mm -hmm. When you think about talent acquisition, how are you measuring the impact of the moves that you're making? And I know that's like a yeah. broad question because like depending on what the objective is, you'll have different uh, measurables. But I guess generally speaking, what's the framework by which you approach that? Yes. So um, my holy grail is um, a dashboard. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have one, I strongly believe you need one. Um, if you can't afford something like, and I'm not talking like the, the ones that a uh, greenhouse has the helpful, um, but you don't get all of your data in one single pane of glass. If you have the budget for something like gem, buy it. If not, um, do what I did and find a blog about, um, what the functionality of their um, different dashboards are, match that up to uh, what your C-suite cares about and go build it yourself. Um, in our case, that's what we did. So um, it's all built out in um, Google. And so we are looking at 
all of like the typical metrics, right? Like time to fill, time to hire, open roles, um, acceptance rate, cost per hire. We're looking at um, applications. Um, we, my team reports into the um, CFO, and so we're super cost conscious um, and <clears throat> want to be able to account for every operational dollar um, there. Um, and so, yeah, so like the, I live and die by that dashboard um, and just taking kind of like snapshots of you know, where were we at on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. Um, and that's actually how we um, end up sending our OKRs uh, for the quarter. Again, being measured against those big like, four operational goals that we get um, for the from the C-suite at the beginning of the year. Um, but a lot of it's coming out of that out of that data. And so um, I also am benchmarking against two uh, pieces of data in that dashboard. So one, what does the industry standard from the previous year suggest that we should be at for time to hire, time to fill, acceptance rate, things like that by department. Um, so that's one. And then like, where were we at the year before? And then how do we consistently try to drive towards meeting or achieving that. Yep. That makes sense. Interesting mm -hmm. that you were, so you're, the talent team reports into the CFO. I'm curious, you know, how that, how those dynamics play out when you're thinking about like, we need to make more investment in talent acquisition here or there, or this tool or that tool, like what advice because there's a lot of folks that aren't reporting directly to the CFO, but they've got to go to the CFO or to finance, you know, for budget to do certain things. So what advice now that you're in a role where you're reporting directly to the CFO, I imagine you have a closer working relationship in that regard. So what advice would you have for people that, you know, everybody's being asked to do more with less, be more efficient, uh, be budget conscious as we should always be in running our businesses. Um, so long way of asking, what advice would you have for people in talent acquisition, you know, for the best way to approach a CFO yeah. about an investment or additional spend when the mantra throughout the whole organization is do more with yeah. less. So we actually have like a little bit of an interesting reporting model. Uh, previously, um, HR and TA reported into the CFO. We brought in this like super kick-ass chief people officer. Like I fangirl so hard over her, like she was the best. <laughs> um, and so she like, reports both to the CFO and to the CEO, um, which is really cool because we get like a direct line to each of them. Um, but, um, man, really, it all comes back to relationships. Listen, TA, those of us that are in like TA, we're here and we're successful because we're really good at building relationships with people and we're good at negotiating. So we need to leverage those things. Um, some examples of how to do that. Um, one, build a relationship with your CFO, build a relationship with your CEO. When it comes to, uh, talent acquisition and hiring, both of them will have some sort of exposure with it and some form or facet, figure out what that is and figure out what they care about. That becomes how you frame conversations. Um, the other thing, um, if you need to get, uh, scrappy or creative, um, there are so many tools out there that are super cool, um, very helpful, and um, there's new one pop new ones popping up all the time. Um, and more often than not, these companies, uh, particularly if you're in a startup and you share um, investors, are willing to give you free trials or partnership trials or extreme discounts on using these tools. So if you can figure out how to partner with an organization um, that has a specific product or tool set or thing that you need and you can figure out how to do it for a discounted cost um, or free, um, do that because that six months or that year that you get at 
you know, running at no cost is six months to a year to one, evaluate the tool and two, build a business case and three, prove ROI. Yeah, that's spot on. That couldn't be any more spot on. Like one, you're building the business case. So when you go to request the budget, you have, um, you know, much more to show in why the investment that you want to make is a wise investment. And two, I think under the lens of the relationship building, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of that comes down to trust. And I think when you can go to somebody in the C-suite, whether it's the CFO or the CEO, and you can show them, here's what I have already done to solve this problem on my own. I've been scrappy. I've, I've done this. I've done that. Here's how it's working. Here's the early indicators of success. Now I'm asking for this because we've seen what our success could look like when we've done it this way. And now I believe you know, we're at the point of maturity in which we're ready to make an investment into a bigger and better tool or whatever it is. Um, and I think when somebody in the C-suite sees that you've already, you know, taken steps and you've made progress and you've done things on your own, you've been resourceful and you've proved out that there's a strong working hypothesis here that this thing can really turn into something. It just needs a little bit more fuel to the fire. It, A, you know, builds trust in the sense that they know that you have the best uh, interest of the business in mind because you went about it by trying to be as efficient and scrappy as you possibly could. Um, and so it builds trust in that way. And B, it builds confidence because you're not just going on a whim and saying like, hey, I think we should do this. I have this idea and I want to spend money on it. Like you've actually got a working model. You've actually proved something. And so I think like you really hit it home there where like if you can if you can do that, um, you know, it takes those relationships with the C-suite to a whole new level. And I think to your earlier point, it kind of all ties back to business mm -hmm. acumen and the importance of that and talent acquisition is like when you can frame things up that make sense to people in the realm and the world in which they see the business, like yeah. everything is so much easier. Yeah. Easier said than done, totally. obviously. Um, and it's not always, but, it's not you always know, gonna work, right? Like it's, it's, not a, yep. it's not a foolproof. You're not always gonna bat. 500 um, or a yep. thousand. You're not always in about a thousand. Yep. You might not even have 500. <laughs> you can probably get really solid. Yeah. Well, I'm a baseball so, player. So if you bat 300, saying, like, it's we, good we in my book. We can probably get like a solid 300, <laughs> maybe a 330. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. um, but like if you can take like that experience and that information to anyone in the C suite and say, look, this was the challenge. Here's how I tried to solve it. Here's what it looks like in practice using real data with our team and our function in practice. I know this is our bottom line. I know this is what we care about. I have reversed engineered it into a model that says, you know, based off of what I have been told Q3 is going to look like. If we did X, Y, Z, this is what we could expect. Um, that's like a really solid case. And worst case scenario, yeah. they're gonna be like, yeah, we just don't have the budget for it right now, but man, do they know you're a solid problem solver now. And um, yeah. you've probably figured out some other things that you can work into your current process that is going to alleviate some of that challenge. Um, not in the easy, pretty way that it would have by investing in a new tool, but you're going to be better um, than you were. Yep. Love it. Well, Amanda, this has been awesome. Um, I've learned so much in talking to you and I'm sure the audience will as well. So I really appreciate you coming on and joining me. Yeah, this is awesome. And it was great getting to know you and a little bit more about Submittable. So thanks so much. Thank you, Josh.